Hi, welcome to Med City News' Invest Conference. My name is Orunduti Parmar, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Med City News. I hope you've been enjoying some of the content that we've been putting together uh, for this week. So COVID-19 has propelled two important issues to the fore, a much needed renewal of interest in diagnostics and the consumerization of healthcare. At-home testing marries these two developments. Our panel today will discuss how this will extend beyond the pandemic and the limitations and strengths of at-home testing. First up, we have Dr. Priya Radhakrishnan. She is the Chief Academic Officer and Vice President of Social Determinants of Health and Equity at Honor Health. Dr. Radhakrishnan is a board certified internist with an interest in treating patients with chronic complex illness and is a physician leader with extensive experience. She oversees the medical education programs for Honor Health and is leading this SDOH collaborative that connects the health system, stakeholders and community partners. Dr. Radhakrishnan is also leading the Vaccines for Vulnerable Populations project. She's the current governor for the Arizona chapter of the American College of Physicians. She was a physician advisor for the Practice Innovation Institute created by a CMS Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative grant that impacted 2,500 clinicians in Arizona. Dr. Radhakrishnan received her undergraduate medical degree at Calicut Medical College in India and completed her residency in pathology at Trivandrum Medical College. She then, then completed her internal med medicine residency at Lincoln Hospital and Mental Health Center and St. Francis Hospital at Evanston, Illinois. Welcome to you, Dr. Radhakrishnan. Next up, we have Sean Slavinsky, CEO of BioIQ. Sean is recognized as a healthcare industry innovator with 30 years of success. As former senior vice president and president of Walmart Health, Sean led the launch of multidisciplinary healthcare clinics known as the Super Centers for Healthcare. Today, Sean serves as the CEO of BioIQ, a company modernizing the diagnostic testing industry through a national network of labs and customized solutions that support health plans, employers, and consumers. By aggregating testing solutions, optimizing lab capacity, and integrating testing with customers' needs and strategies, BioIQ helps ensure stability and resilience for employers and health plans by detecting disease to protect their workforce and members. Welcome to you, Sean. Dr. Arkita Duron. She's the Associate Medical Director for 98.6 and is an enlightened expert. Dr. Deruin is a double board certified family medicine and lifestyle medicine physician. She currently serves as Associate Medical Director at 98.6, a telemedicine startup with a novel approach to accessible on-demand primary care. Dr. Deruin serves as a thought leader in healthcare innovation, she is passionate about merging the humanistic aspect of medicine with the new field of emerging technology. Dr. Deruin believes in putting people first, whether that be in patient care, management, or in her personal life. Her unique skill set includes, but is not limited to health equity, expertise, service of underserved populations, HIV management, transgender care, and lifestyle medicine. Dr. Deruin brings a diversity to the team with a goal to shake up the landscape to provide compassionate care to all who seek it. Welcome to you, Dr. Deruin. And next we have Peter Foley, CEO of Let's Get Checked. He's also the founder of Let's Get Checked, a health insights platform which allows consumers to access laboratory testing and clinical support services in the home. What sparked the idea for Let's Get Checked was a personal experience which resulted in Peter not having access to diagnostic testing in a time of need. Prior to Let's Get Checked, Peter worked in a number of consultancy roles specializing in the fields of healthcare strategy, planning, and facility development, as well as completing a law degree and master's qualification in ICD-10 coding. As CEO and founder of Let's Get Checked, Peter is committed to putting people in the driving seat and making them part of the diagnostic testing process. The purpose of the company is to give people the knowledge that they need to live healthier, happier lives. Welcome to you, Peter. Dr. Radhakrishnan, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Arundhati and uh, Med City News. Uh, my name is Dr. Priya Radhakrishnan, and it's my incredible pleasure to moderate uh, 
this topic, uh, at-home testing uh, for COVID particularly. Uh, we live in very interesting times. Uh, I never thought that I'd be giving uh, meeting after meeting and uh, talk after talk uh, on virtual technology, but here we are. And uh, really grateful uh, to Met City News to showcase this important uh, topic. And at-home testing is very much hot uh, in the press. Uh, a few days ago, uh, the FDA cleared a bunch of at-home testing. And so uh, we'll jump right into introductions. And uh, I'm gonna start with myself, Priya Reddick Krishnan. I'm an internist by training, chief academic officer and vice president for health equity. We've lived and breathed COVID for the last year. Uh, taking care of our teams, our patients, and agonizing over testing and now vaccinations. And now I'm going to introduce Dr. Didroing. Arkita, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hello. Thank you, Med City and Oren Doty and Dr. Priya. I am Urquita DeRowan. I'm a family medicine physician who is an associate medical director for a telehealth organization called 98.6. And as Dr. Priya said, COVID has overtaken every facet of healthcare, especially the telehealth industry. And I'm excited to chat with you guys today about COVID testing. Thank you. And uh, next we'll uh, go to Mr. Peter Foley. Peter, would you introduce yourself, please? <clears throat> yeah, thanks for, for having us today. Delighted to, um, to meet everyone and to, to be able to speak to the, this topic, this very important topic. Um, my name is Peter Foley and I'm the CEO and founder at Let's Get Checked. Um, Let's Get Checked is a, is a consumer diagnostics platform that enables um, home testing uh, for consumers. We're, we're full stack. Um, so we're the technology layer, we're the manufacturing of medical devices, we're the laboratory and we're the telehealth infrastructure that sits on top. So we've been fortunate through the pandemic to be able to play um, a vital role in, in bringing essential diagnostics into the home and support for people too. So thank you for having me today. Thank you, Peter. And uh, last but certainly not the least, uh, Mr. Sean Slovensky. Hi, well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here and be part of this group. What a fantastic topic to talk about today as we're uh, growing more and more into innovation in the home testing space, and it's becoming more of um, a standardized thing versus that extra thing that people wanted to do. I'm currently the CEO of a company called BioIQ, and we are a home testing company. And uh, obviously in the world of COVID, I'm sure like so many others, we've um, jumped into that space to help our country out in this pandemic and I'm pretty excited to be part of this conversation today to talk about how that is going and where we see the future going. Thank you, Sean. And so we'll start with uh, just a simple question uh, to all of our panelists, uh, at-home testing, good or bad? And the context is, uh, you know, President Biden's national strategy for COVID-19 response and pandemic preparedness, gosh, that's a mouthful. Uh, and uh, the US uh, Department of Health and Human Services has allocated about $10 billion uh, to really accelerate diagnostics. It's called the RADx initiative. And uh, I think, um, like you mentioned, Sean, I think that we have moved into a rapid cycle innovation space, and this will lead to, we hope, several more um, innovation, uh, but then it, you know everything comes with sort of a, a negative, and we'll be discussing that as well. So, starting with you, Sean, at home testing, good or bad? Yeah, so um, I'm going to give a yes and no answer to that. Um, it's good for those circumstances and those people that it's good for, and it will be good for those that it's not today because they're just not aware of it yet. So, overall, I think it's good. Um, I think it's good because so many people don't go get routine di diagnostics that they need. They don't keep tabs on their health like they need to, and they don't go visit the doctor. And like we've seen with telemedicine, not only for those that want to go to the doctor but couldn't, now they can explore telemedicine as an option. Those that were curious about going to see a doctor for a health issue 
are now open to it and participating in telehealth and telemedicine. The same thing is happening, we're seeing in diagnostics, those that would never go get a test because it's scary or they'd have to go to the doctor first, now they can actually have it in the privacy of their own home. In many cases, they can do the test themselves and mail it off to get the results. And it's a lot less threatening uh, than it used to be. So we're seeing a tremendous uptick, not just because of COVID, but also people now be inquiring about other testing that can happen in their home because it's just so convenient and cost effective. Thank you. Arkita, as a primary care doc, at home testing, good or bad? I think that it's phenomenal. I'll, I'll take it up a notch. I, I agree that there are some limitations to getting testing in person. There may be staffing issues with the workforce and everyone getting COVID in healthcare. Um, there may also be limitations in terms of access to going to get a test or leaving work or exposing other people to a potential virus. So that I, I think that having the opportunity to receive at-home testing can actually help decrease this public health emergency. Thank you. And Peter, uh, for you, at home testing, <laughs> yeah. good or bad? It, it's, uh, it's great. It's brilliant. Um, I think, like, look, if, if we think about the traditional process of, of getting a lab test done, it was needing to go to a physician's office and then ultimately determining whether it was appropriate and then going to a drop-in center to get it done. And it's it's a multi-step process. Um, and what home diagnostics does uh, is it, it brings it into home and removes a ton of those steps. So it makes it super convenient and pulls people into it. They're more likely to do it. I think what we've seen through the, the pandemic, of course, is that you know, there, there, was, there was traditional ways of how people access healthcare, particularly diagnostics. Um, and what the, the pandemic has done is it, it's, it's brought this stuff truly into the home. It's changed consumer sentiment. It's changed how people think they can access healthcare. Uh, and that's true for, for, for telehealth. I think it's probably been brought forward 10 years. Uh, and same with diagnostics. You know, people people understand what it is and they, they know they can access this a different way. But to answer your question directly, um, home health testing is, is very, very good. Thank you. So I think we have a unanimous uh, vote from our panelists that uh, at-home testing is awesome. Uh, we will talk about some of the maybe not so awesome parts as well so that, you know, we get sort of both points of view. And I'd like to jump in uh, and really talk about workflows and how do we sort of operationalize it. And so, you know, with COVID, uh, we, uh, the news uh, was, news cycle was full of all of the different pitfalls and, you know, you get a test, but you have COVID, you have COVID, your test is negative. So I'd like to start with uh, asking Arkita just to give us an overview of the types of testing. Yes. So, so as you mentioned, there are lots of different workflows that have come from different healthcare environments. And as a primary care doctor, especially with or people who are working in person, they had to develop things quickly in order to keep themselves safe and their patients safe. So typically, in terms of workflows, if someone were to call into a primary care clinic, they are asked a questionnaire by a medical assistant or a nurse. And depending on what symptoms they're showcasing, they may be directed to go to a specific respiratory clinic where people who are all having respiratory symptoms are seen in the same location with masks. Or they may be prompted to come to certain outside or parking lot clinics where people would be swabbed in their cars or lined up where there is more ventilation. Um, from a telehealth perspective, the industry definitely boomed because you didn't have to go in person. So for the telehealth organizations that were already up and running, things were, were kind of workflows were put in place in order to triage an enormous amount of patients that were not necessarily utilizing telehealth initially and organizations that were affiliated with private practices or hospital systems had to implement telehealth in a warp speed fashion where they were kind of seeing patients due to their symptoms or even if a doctor or 
another healthcare provider were quarantined in that very sick, they could still see patients. So definitely there were many workflows that were in place to kind of triage who was sick and needed to be triaged to be seen immediately in an emergency room facility versus who could be seen in person or outdoors or who could come on to a telehealth thing and be referred to get testing or to isolate. And from there, there are different types of testing. So in terms of the tests that are available, there was nucleic acid-based testing, which kind of detects the viral RNA. And this is usually done by a nasal or pharyngeal swab where they kind of go up the nose or the throat. And I know a lot of listeners are probably already familiar with that. And it kind of is able to test and see how much viral genetic material grows. And it takes a couple of days to come back, but it's usually very sensitive and very specific and usually quite accurate. There are other tests that kind of test for the antigen. This detects the the proteins that are on the surface of the virus. And for that is usually also nasal or throat. And with that, it's more so like what some of the rapid tests do and it can come back in minutes. Although it may miss certain viruses because there needs to be a certain amount of virus uh, levels detected. And we can talk a little more about that later. And then there are other tests that a lot of people have been thinking about, and I know that it's been in the news, antibody tests, where they detect the antibodies that are growing in the, the, from the immune system. And it's done by blood sample via venipuncture or a finger prick. And it kind of detects whether or not you have been exposed to the virus or had it but it doesn't show active infection and it's actually not recommended to do if you've had any illness within two weeks of taking the test. So these are a little variable as well in terms of accuracy. And as we've all seen in the news, sometimes the antibodies kind of wane and we're trying to do studies now to see how long protection can last, either both with actual infection from COVID or now for people who have been vaccinated. Thank you. That was a really uh, wonderful overview. And, and really, uh, for our listeners to know, you know, two types of tests, antigen and antibody. And the rapid tests that have just been approved are typically mRNA um, tests. Uh, most of them are mRNA tests. Uh, uh, which I'd like to move to uh, Peter uh, to tell us a little bit about sort of, you know, at-home testing and direct-to-consumer uh, testing and what the trends are uh, in the market. And then particularly, you know, we'll come back to COVID as well. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think kind of to the point of um, ways to test <clears throat> from a home perspective, like early on in the pandemic, it was very important to we, we saw different kind of testing modalities validated. So ways in which someone could collect a sample in the home, because I think ultimately one of the barriers to, to home testing at the start was the requirement to do a nasopharyngeal swab. A nasopharyngeal was used typically because traditionally for flu testing, that was done in a physician's office and that was the swab method utilized. So I think we were we were all very fortunate on the market that the the Gates study there was a Gates Foundation study with United Healthcare, where they managed to to validate a lower nasal swab from a self collection standpoint. And what that did is it provided a foundation to the market to go and do additional validation studies for in the home, so usability, stability data, and that's what we focused on. <clears throat> so like Let's Get Checked, who provide a home testing solution, it is a lower nasal swab, much more easier for the user to do. The virus is also super conducive for this, high viral load, high viral load in the lower nasal part uh, passage. Um, so it's, it supported that. Um, but look, I, I think, you know, during a pandemic, access is the key point. Um, and we found ourselves supplying not only for direct to consumer, we saw an obvious boom, but we also, for, for our clients, whether they, they be health plans, large employers, providing these services directly to people, but also for, for states and governments, um, which were, I suppose, the lion's share of testing wasn't just done in the home. It was also done through these mobile um, units and services where people could book an appointment and turn up. So it was very much a multi-pronged approach to testing and continues to be so um, throughout the pandemic. Um, 
Well, like, look, I, I think an, an important aspect is everyone's so focused on COVID testing and like the other things don't go away, you know, diabetes hasn't gone away. Colon cancer hasn't gone away. These things are, are still there. They're still happening. And we we're seeing a, a massive downturn in the amount of tests that have been performed in 2020. And there's a consequence to that. So, you know, part of what we're focused on and I'm sure Sean is as well is, you know, how do we get that upswing again to make sure that these essential tests are being done in the home um, and t as the ones that we just discussed, so. Thank you. Um, and, and Sean, uh, your vantage point, particularly uh, for, you know, insurances and uh, Medicare Advantage groups, uh, how do you see the, the trends? Yeah, well, you know, picking up on a couple things that Peter had said, I think are important as you're looking down the road over the next 12 to 24 months, there are two things that happened. There was a, a backlog in the ability to test enough people in, with COVID um, until the supply chain started to get itself worked out and the research started to come out in the innovation so that you could have more useful layperson delivered testing. What it showed in at least the US um, is that the current laboratory network and supply chain, which is largely you know, two primary groups, um, it got overwhelmed. And you can start looking forward and Peter kind of touched on this and we're seeing this with the managed care plans around COVID testing, but also routine diagnostic testing. People have waited to have routine diagnostics done. And so now we're gonna have this groundswell of people coming back into the healthcare system, wanting to make up for lost time. And when you look at the numbers of people that need to have routine testing that have not done it like they normally would or should over the last 12 to 18 months, you're gonna start seeing the laboratory systems, networks and supply chains getting overwhelmed with routine testing like they did with COVID testing. And so, in our opinion, what a, lot, what a lot of this means is that innovation just became really critically important and rapid innovation. And while no disparagement meant towards laboratories themselves, one of the things that we've been working on with a lot of the groups that we deal with out there in the innovation front is how can you remove the laboratory altogether? Um, you know, what are some of the emerging testing technologies that would allow you to have a reliable test for COVID or for some of these other routine diagnostics where the customer doesn't have to take the test and then mail it anywhere. They can just take the test and the result gets recorded and do that in a cost effective way. And for some testing that's coming in the next few months for other testing, it's going to be the next few years. But before COVID, it would have been a decade before a lot of that would have happened. Um, so we're seeing this groundswell on the managed care side of not just making sure that their Medicare Advantage and Medicaid members, et cetera, are getting tested for COVID, um, but also knowing that a tsunami is coming for routine testing as well. And how do you get ready for that now? And the current lab systems aren't prepared for that nationally. So uh, it's a big challenge coming up. Thank you. So as a physician, I've gone through all of the multiple stages of grief uh, that uh, you know, we are all very well aware of in the business literature uh, uh, regarding COVID testing. Uh, um, you know, as Arkita had mentioned, we would, for in our institution, we would actually have uh, anyone with symptoms would get an automatic uh, you know, televisit phone or video, uh, but then we couldn't find testing, you know? So uh, it basically it was just based stay at home and then desperately trying, even our health system, which did a fabulous job in standing up respiratory centers, uh, you know, was like very quickly overwhelmed. And, uh, you know, we do anticipate the next surge coming. We are looking at India where there's a massive surge um, you know, the UK, uh, in, uh, in Europe as well. So um, I think, you know, one of the things that concerns me as a physician and particularly with at-home testing um, is other pitfalls. Uh, you know, um, as a primary care doc, uh, I have had so many patients who do testing and then come and say, interpret it. <laughs> and, you um, and, and, and as a physician, context is the most important thing. Anytime we look at a test, you have to look at, you know, 
pretest probability, we've been taught this in medical school, pretest probability of a positive diagnosis and then the post-test probability uh, and, and interpretation requires those things. And so, you know, while it's wonderful that suddenly, you know, the market is going to be flooded and people have, the, have access to check at home, uh, I, I think we need to make some informed decisions. So uh, I'd like to ask Arkita to start off with, you know, what do you think are the pitfalls, and particularly as we start seeing mutants and variants uh, coming on, long haul COVID, you know, there, there's so many different things. We don't know what we don't know yet. So uh, tell us a little bit about what you think are the pitfalls. I absolutely agree and am appreciative that you stated the obvious that we don't know what we don't know yet, especially with COVID. It's like we're actually living in the times where the scientific process is happening live and in action, similar to like when the HIV epidemic started. And there are so many unknowns. And of course, we know a tremendous amount more than we did a year ago but there are still so many unknown factors. So we, we scrambled to find opportunities to test and what to test for and those kind of things. And the tests have obviously gotten a lot better and now they are in the homes, but there are some factors like these new variants that are popping up where we don't know if it is testing for those or where we are having recommendations for people not to even test within three months of their last COVID infection, where if they may be symptomatic with a new variant, they may be able to catch COVID again and we may be spreading it and causing more public health issues. Um, and then there are the, the, the issues with, are the tests very accurate or sensitive? Uh, per the BMC's virology journal, they did studies on false negative results from respiratory samples of the virus, and they showed a variability of about one to 30%. And that is, is quite, I know that it's dependent on the different types of tests and, and those type of things, but that means that three out of 10 people in the highest level may have a false negative and actually go out into the community and spread the virus even more. So certain things can kind of combat that with educating patients how to appropriately take their samples or figuring out because suboptimal testing collection is definitely one of the variables or figuring out when to test, like when were they exposed? When did their symptoms start? Because testing too early may also cause the test to come back negative. Um, they could also have a lower viral load, um, just depending on when they test, or there's variability in when the virus sheds, or even um, some false testing. Like there have been some really interesting things in telehealth where people are demanding and really need to go back to work just due to the economic structure of our country. So when you're at in an office or in a testing center, you know who you're testing. But if you're sending tests to the home, they may, may test their child or someone else so that they can get that negative result and go back into the community. So there are a lot of factors out there. So home testing is amazing and it's allowing people to test and get back into schools or go back to work. But we have to be cognizant and aware of those different factors that may limit some of the accuracy. I think I think that was a really wonderful um, overview, and you know, um, and I um, uh, as a as a physician, um, uh, I turned the big five zero and did uh, requested uh, ColoGuard, uh, and I'll tell you that it was so complicated to open it that I messed up the box and I had to tape it to send it back, <laughs> and I was hoping that I wouldn't have to repeat it. So uh, I mean, you know, I do have an MD and hundreds of years of experience, I still couldn't figure out how to open the box properly. So I, I think user <laughs> user <laughs> error is something uh, which is really big. And I think you highlighted some of the, you know, big pitfalls. The uh, interesting thing about some of the uh, new testing is many of them are app based. And so, uh, you know, it comes with like a kit, that kit you sort of uh, you plug and play and then you report the test. 
and and then uh, you know there are options of sharing it uh, with your public health department and so on. And so, Peter, uh, one of the questions I have for you is, you know, can you give us a little bit of the overview of app-based testing and also some of the pitfalls and the concerns uh, that you know people might have? Yeah, for sure. I, I think even back to the, the point previously, like one of the benefits of, of home testing is that, you know, it, it is largely governed by FDA. And as part of any EU, EUA submission that happened um, throughout the pandemic, there's a huge slant towards usability data. So everyone who brought a new test to market had to go through pretty onerous processes like we did for making sure that, you know, we looked at uh, underage groups, minors, uh, everyone possible to make sure they understood and used the service properly, which in turn cuts out on some of the issues that were identified there. So what might have a, an impact on accuracy? For a test like ours as well, we were fortunate enough that in a blinded study, we were, we were ranked the most, most analytically home sensitive test on the market. Um, so, you, you know, you're really ensuring that you're getting an accurate test and that you don't get false negatives. Um, but I think the app piece is an important part of that because it, we, we talk about testing in the home, but it's all really, it's really testing on your phone. It doesn't have to be in your home. It's in your phone. It's following you around. Your phone is an extension of you. And what app-based technology allows you to do is you've got really seamless uh, instructions built in very quick access to care teams and support and I think back to that point that you guys raised about you know a result there is a, a result but you have someone to interpret that result so it's that in clin clinical interpretation and having that access to the the caregiver through a, a mobile application for example and something that we pride ourselves on making sure that we're, we're always available we, we talk people through the results before they receive them um, but I, I think ultimately mobile applications are really opening up the horizon of what we can do. And Sean touched on it. And not everything has to be rooted through a laboratory. And uh, we have our own consumer diagnostics lab, but we're not afraid to say that. And um, we're starting to embrace technology where the sample doesn't need to go to a lab. It gives a real time readout. It's folded into the phone like a, through its Bluetooth enabled. And you get a telehealth consultation there and then. So you have a, a let's get checked physician talking you through your results. We can e-prescribe off the back and the whole care pathway is done in real time. So um, I think, you know, app-based technologies are, are really opening up the, the horizon of digital health as a whole, but particularly diagnostics in the home and access around that diagnostic. So I have a follow-up question and I'm not being facetious. I am kind of. Um, and when I log into, uh, you know, any sort of browser, um, up pops up uh, a recommendation for uh, a couch because I was looking for a couch or, you know, a, um, a, a, a piece of makeup or some food because I was looking for a recipe. Uh, do you anticipate uh, a pop-up saying it's time for your color guard <laughs> or, uh, or, or it's time for COVID testing because I've been sort of Googling COVID symptoms? Do you see that happening in the near future or in the remote future? I, I, think, the, I think the thing about healthcare is that, <clears throat> like, is, is there a clinical utility to what you're recommending? Like, I think, like, there will always be, you know, trying to compare Amazon to what we do. Amazon will, like, it's it's an e-commerce store. Like, I bought slippers last week. Do I need a garden hose next week? You can be much more aggressive in terms of what you're pushing. But I, I think, you know, you need to tread a line uh, when it's a, a healthcare service. And what we look at is, is it relevant to the end user? Is it relevant to the customer? And is there clinical utility in what we're trying to provide? But like some of the services that we have through a data engine is we can look at people's kind of dem demographic information and make recommendations that are sensible based on their clinical uh, history. And um, so, look, there, there, there's huge gains to be had. But when I, I think it, an industry thing that people need to be aware of is when we start looking at data concerns and making sure accurate consent is obtained um, and all that stuff go that goes with it. 
So uh, I, I didn't think I would be saying this, but thank God for hip hop, perhaps, uh, because the last thing that I would want are Cola God commercials in my newsfeed. Uh, but moving to you, Sean. So we, we see this, uh, you know, um, direct to consumer and the activated consumers, at least today, are the ones who are sort of availing for this. Can you uh, give us a little overview of testing for very large groups? Because uh, particularly with the FDA, uh, the indications uh, in the emergency use authorization are that it's uh, asymptomatic folks that you know are indicated for testing. So that's really interesting because when I first started, you know, looking at it as a physician to get testing, it was for the symptomatic people. So it does change a little bit as well. But can you give us a little bit of an overview from your vantage point? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And you know, back to uh, uh, earlier dialogue around the infancy that we're at with a lot of this, it reminds me back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when the internet had just really had a plethora of health information. And I was running a bunch of urgent care occupational medicine clinics. And I remember the doctors coming in at the end of the week for the weekly meeting with their hands in their heads going, if I have one more patient come in and tell me they diagnosed themselves from something they read online, and they're telling me how to practice medicine, I'm just going to jump off the roof. And I think we're going to see some of that here too, because it's going to take time for people to get diagnosed at home, know what's good, what's not good, what's accurate, what's not accurate for the doctors and other healthcare professionals to get used to talking about and educating the customer. And then how do you interflow telemedicine into that? I, I think we've got a few years of working out those kinks, but it feels very similar to this overwhelming wild west. And I think that's analogous to what we're seeing within the group programs, you know, probably very much like Let's Get Checked, we're working with a lot of employers. And these employers have manufacturing locations, corporate office locations, um, specialty need locations where they're running three shifts doing all kinds of different work. And the type of testing that's needed, rapid versus you can wait a few days to get a more accurate result, um, very different. Um, in the food manufacturing space, you know, they need it now because they need to staff those places so that Americans can have food on the table. Um, where other industries, you, you can wait a few days before people come in. But you're right, at first it was symptomatic people. Now it's all asymptomatic. They want to try to catch it um, before it becomes a spreadable problem. And probably just in the last six months, we've seen a lot of these large employers, especially in their entertainment industry, but also the food industry, lay out a three to five year plan and budget for this type of testing, even though they know vaccine is here and it's coming, but no one knows how long will it really last? Um, will it work with all the variants or not? There's so much unknown. So we've gone from, can you test our people a little bit now to let's lay out a three to five year plan. And every testing methodology, on-site, group screening, at-home test kits, it's all being deployed based on their needs and um, you know, the, the basic functions that they have to deal with within their work environment. It's, it's massive um, and only growing. Uh, I think, you know, you're spot on. When COVID started, we, uh, you know, we were like, okay, you know, this will go away in six to 12 months. But very quickly, it became obvious that, uh, you know, it would be uh, more like the flu, at least that's what it seems right now. And there's going to be some element of COVID, you know, persisting. And, and just the, uh, you know, kind of hot off the presses, we thought, okay, vaccination was our, you know, savior, and we were all like thrilled. And then now we're starting to see post-COVID vaccination um, or va uh, post-vaccination COVID. So we, we're not uh, entirely out of the woods. And, and a, lo a large part of, you know, what we can do uh, and, and getting away from, uh, you know, Zoom meetings, for sure, I think it's something that all of us can say, well, it's lovely to see you all um, on the screen, it would be so much nicer to see you in person. And, and it, it really begs the question, uh, which is now the next big question that I'd like to ask you all is about cost. So uh, yes, you know, we have, you know, $20 billion, but $20 billion uh, really was, you know, a, a, lar a large portion was for R&D, but the, the, the other part was implementation. 
And if you talk about going back to a concert, for example, you know, I mean, I love music, haven't been uh, to a concert for over a year. And, uh, you know, how do we sort of operationalize the cost? So we start with sort of, you know, my cost as, as a person uh, and, you know, a person for just doing my activities of daily living, going out, you know, um, going to work, <laughs> I think is, is like a big, big sort of threshold. The, the second is, you know, things that are valuable. Well, CDC just allowed everybody to travel, but then now we'll watch and see what happens with the surges, right? Uh, if you're vaccinated, you can travel. So now what happens if you're traveling and now there's COVID? So I'd like to start uh, with you, Sean, uh, and you know, uh, give us sort of your crystal ball about sort of cost. Who's going to pay for it? Uh, how are we going to sort of, uh, you know, take care of uh, COVID, uh, you know, I think all all governments are are slowly going broke, and a good amount of GDP actually is being pushed to COVID. So, uh, at the risk of education, police, uh, uh, you know, the uh, safety, and so on. So, Sean, uh, we'll start with you. Tell us what your crystal ball says. Sure. Um, well, don't go buy a lottery ticket right now <laughs> off of my crystal ball, but um, <laughs> here's uh, here's here's kind of what our speculation and what we're seeing. And I, I think two things we've already talked about play a major factor, the innovation and the speed of it in the flu. So whoever's paying for flu testing and flu shots today is probably who will be paying for this in the future. So it's in large part gonna be a lot of insurers, right? They just haven't all gotten there yet, but it's probably gonna go there. In terms of cost, you know, the thing that surprised me, 25, 50, $100 for a COVID test today, depending on where you got it and if it's rapid or not. But some of the technologies that we're working with right now, and, and we don't own laboratories at BioIQ, we use other people's capacity and their tests, and we are the distributors and, and the logistics behind all of that, plus, plus a little more. So we're very open to who, who's next and who's new. We're seeing rapid tests that are highly accurate and sensitive um, that are, are cost a dollar to manufacture. So you theoretically could sell it at cost, right? Or you could mark it up for another dollar. And so now you have a $2 test or a $1 test. So as an employer, if I have 80,000 employees spread throughout the country with different needs, boy, I'd rather pay a buck or two bucks um, than the $49 I'm paying today times that number of people. So I think we're going to see like everything, electronics, all that stuff. It's going to get really, really cheap, but really quickly, like within the next couple of years. Um, and that's going to allow this testing to occur at a greater scale. And I think we're going to see this become the flu. Um, and that's kind of, you know, all of our advisors and scientists we have on our advisory board, they've, they've all kind of said, well, nobody really knows, but if we had to speculate, this is what's going to happen and who's going to pay. Thank you. And uh, Peter, uh, to you, uh, what are your sort of crystal ball uh, predictions? Yeah, I, it will be largely aligned to um, to Sean. I, I think in the in that um, <clears throat> for for mass scale into the future, um, and to the point of people can't continue to pay a hundred bucks for a test each time. Um, it's just higher frequency. You're you're kind of foregoing that real sensitivity for more frequency. It's more affordable, and you can do it at scale. Um, I think ultimately, where where we'll see though in the because what we find with some of our employer uh, contracts is that they say this, but then they also say, well, look, we we do want the reassurance that it's a it's it's definitely correct. So you know, high frequency antigen test, but then every once in a while, marry it with a, with a PCR that gives you that peace of mind. But uh, as we kind of see how the, the PCR and, and lab-based test evolving and how we see the, you know, the, these contracts happening at a government level for bringing kids back to school, it's definitely more with the lens of how do we take that accuracy, but also bring the price down and make it scalable. And I think where the market's going is towards things like pooling. So you, rather than having one person for one test at a, at a hundred bucks, you're doing five people with that one test and five is your denominator. 
so there, there's a there's a constant evolution in the market and um, i think you just got to stay super nimble with it uh, and make sure that you know as a provider of home diagnostics that you're bringing the best possible solution to the market for your clients and for your customers so um th- there's a level of yeah crystal balls are broken at this stage <laughs> um but um yeah like it, it, it's definitely an evolving space with uh with with cost now being um top of mind thank you i'd like to transition so from costs to uh the digital divide and the wealth divide uh, you know covid has shown that uh, healthcare disparities are really uh you know um well and alive and unfortunately um, you know, it, it, it's been uh, very tragic. Uh, and take going from a global scale, so, you know, we have the countries which are the haves or haves not. And then within our communities, uh, COVID, t- uh, COVID testing initially, but now vaccination has revealed that, um, you know, the, uh, co- uh, the zip codes that are affluent uh, are the highly vaccinated zip codes. Uh, the inner city rural areas are low vaccinated. Uh, even, you know, we know the, uh, the mortality from COVID, uh, you know, in, in Arizona, for example, our, our Navajo nation had one of the highest mortality, even more than in New York City. Um, and so, um, you know, one of my big concerns, uh, particularly in the work that I've done with equity is that very quickly, uh, this testing is going to be a means for people who have the access, who have uh, ability to pay for it, either out of pocket or otherwise to access this testing. And then again, we are back to sort of small, uh, you know, inner city schools, large employers, blue collar workers uh, with, with, without access. And so, uh, uh, Erkid, I'm going to start with you and, you know, uh, give us your thoughts on testing and, you know, particularly um, as a physician, uh, how do you, uh, and, you know, with telehealth, um, uh, we've seen at least in our practice that telehealth actually provided increased access to underrepresented minority groups because you didn't have to take the four hours to travel to see a doctor for 15 minutes. <laughs> but, but again, it, it all depended on whether you had Wi-Fi and you had internet access. So uh, Arkita, uh, tell us about what you think, uh, particularly in terms of the wealth and the digital divide for testing. I think you hit like the nail right on the head with all of that information. I know that this past year has definitely highlighted all of the healthcare disparities that are have been prevalent for ages, and we've been taking closer looks at the social determinants of health, and all of it's interconnected with like education level and their health literacy, with um, their economic issues, and if they're able to afford things like smartphones where they can access different things, or if they have to choose between that and their nutrition, if they, they have the certain um, community um, support, and all of those kind of things are very important in how to gain access. And then when you speak about rural areas, of physicians in person care for 20% of America's population, which is rural. So there is definitely a divide. And when we think about putting all of the things like 5G and things out there, a lot of places they don't have access to get the service to, to, to be able to connect. And yes, they are growing. And I know that with some of the plans of this current administration, they're trying to get more access out into the rural community so that they can utilize certain services and and learn about certain things. But not only does, is there a disparity and a decrease in obtaining testing if they can't use digital devices or go in person, there is also a decrease in education and information sharing. So a lot of times that right now, patients are getting a lot of their information, whether or not we like it or not, from the health standpoint, because usually we're used to providing after visit summaries or telling someone to go to a reputable journal or something like that. But a lot of people are getting information from social media. So there is a digital divide in terms of what access people have to learning certain things. Like there is a very popular 
blogger and Instagrammer, I think called uh, your local epidemiologist who's teaching people like, this is what you get tested for. If you have symptoms, stay home. So if people aren't able to get that kind of information, they may spread as we've seen in those more um, segregated communities, like you mentioned in Navajo Nation, where there isn't a lot of uh, information technology transfer. So there's, there isn't a lot, of, there's more spread. So I, I think that we do need to reach people where they are and figure out ways to increase the technology so that there will be less digital divide and decrease healthcare disparities. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I'm going to go to you next as an entrepreneur and as someone who is, uh, you know, really uh, taking um, at home testing uh, to a different level. How do you see, uh, you know, companies like yourself addressing the wealth and digital divide? Um, yeah, like uh, I think ultimately it's, it's, a, it's a terrible story just to, to see this stuff happen. And it, it's not... It's not just um, isolated to diagnostics, but we're seeing it with, with vaccination rollouts as well, um, as you pointed to. Um, and there's no clear cut answer, unfortunately. Um, I think ultimately, you know, like why we set this company up is to, to help people and get testing and clinical services to people who need it the most, um, and particularly people who don't have insurance. Um, <clears throat> and I think, you know, there's a couple of factors. Cost is definitely a, a barrier. Um, it's, it's not just where you live, but can you afford it? So, you know, like when, when we look at the services that we try to provide, particularly around the context of COVID and trying to make them accessible to different groups is, you know, how, how do you really bring the cost down to make them these things accessible? Like one thing that we did through uh, colorectal cancer awareness month was we donated up to... Um, a million dollars worth of tests to um, various groups that could um, disperse them to make them accessible for people. But even when you, you know, you, you get past the price hurdle, it's exactly to the point. You, you can make something digital and assume that people can access it, but if they don't have the devices to access it, you, you're, you're back to, to square one. Um, so it, it, it's difficult, but we as a, as an organization, like every organization, like Sean as well, um, need to be part of, of the solution, you know, not just providing the services that we provide to certain groups, but all groups. Um, and it, it, it's just a continuing discussion point and we just need to all make sure that we're, we're working towards uh, a fair and equitable healthcare system. Thank you. And Sean, uh, particularly looking at Medicaid and, you know, some of the uh, um, uh, folks who are really, uh, who have significant healthcare disparities. You know, one of the things maybe I'll because I agree with and share all the same sentiments and efforts, et cetera. Um, there's one thing that we've learned over the last few years at BioIQ and that, you know, I've been particularly interested in uh, these last few years and have seen come to life even more strongly as COVID testing and the vaccine has come out um, in minority communities. But even if they have access to the technologies, there is a great distrust. When you look at many of the African-American communities, um, a lot of them are very familiar with the Tuskegee um, uh, trial around syphilis back in the 40s and the 50s and how they were lied to by the government um, on what they were actually receiving and not receiving. And similar things have happened in the Native American communities as well. And so even when we're doing um, offering diagnostic testing or offering um, vaccinations, and they have access and can't afford. Um, they're still like, nope, my, my grandfather or my great grandfather, you know, we just don't trust anything that comes from the government um, because of what happened back then. And so we're finding we have to fight two battles at once. One is the access, the affordability. The other is um, stigma um, from past actions. And sometimes that's even stronger than the lack of access. In other words, we can walk into some communities and hand them tests for free, but they still won't take it um, because they don't trust it because that came from the government, so to speak, or that vaccine came from the government. And that's one thing that we don't always hear a lot of people talk about, but we find when you're on the street, it's very real. Um, so those are my two cents to the conversation. 
Thank you. I, I, I learned so much just hearing uh, all of you talk and uh, from all of your vantage points, uh, we come to the end of our uh, talk and I'd like our uh, uh, speakers to tell us, uh, you know, just briefly, what do you want the listeners to take away uh, about uh, the topic at hand, at home testing, particularly COVID? Uh, I'm gonna start uh, with you, Sean. Sure. I think the big thing is to stay vigilant and learning about what's coming and what's accurate and what's not accurate. Because just like the internet back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there are going to be a million different things available all of a sudden, but that doesn't mean they're all good. So uh, do your homework and look at reliable groups like Let's Get Checked, for example, um, for your information so that you're offering the right thing that you can actually trust. Thank you. Arkita. I definitely agree with Sean in terms of making sure that where you're getting your information is reliable and reputable. And a lot of that can start with reputable organizations like Let's Get Checked, but also checking in with your caregivers. There's a lot of information out there and that's what you can utilize us for. So it's okay to send a message in the portal to your primary care provider or go on certain websites where there is a lot of information out there. There is the John Hopkins COVID tracker, and there are a lot of different things that local health departments are putting out to educate you on where you can get tested, when you should get tested, because the information is evolving day by day. So what we may be talking about today may be definitely different in three months. So just staying abreast and and on top of your information is very important. Thank you. And Peter, you're on mute. I I think ultimately we're seeing um, a massive evolution in healthcare in a a very short space of time. Um, I think in in our lifetime, we've seen industries move quickly and overnight. Um, Like you look at things like Netflix in our home now, um, how Amazon evolved from an e-commerce perspective. And I think the moment is now for, for healthcare. Uh, and that level of change is good. Um, but to, to Sean's point as well, um, you, you will get an influx of things that maybe aren't as good. Um, and just to, while embracing this change and while it's the, the best thing and best outcome for, for customers and patients alike, uh, quality is key. Um, so making sure that you're working with quality providers um, like the groups that are here today. Um, and look, like the, the FDA was set up for very reasons such as this. Uh, and people go through uh, very tough, onerous processes before they can bring something to market. So all the information is there. Um, and just to make sure that what you're working with is listed accordingly. Um, so that would be my uh, two cents for today. Thank you. And uh, with that, uh, we come to the end of this uh, wonderful session. I truly learned a lot from all of you. Uh, As we talk today uh, and going up, the COVID-19 death toll is uh, 3 million people globally. Uh, You know, a considerable proportion of our population has been wiped out. Um, Significant, uh, we have had a significant loss in our older population. Uh, Many communities have lost an entire generation. Uh, For some communities, COVID-19 has uh, caused a significant loss in the memory because our older uh, populations were the uh, owners of, of stories and memories. Um, and for our children, COVID-19 has really isolated them and really uh, stopped their uh, growth, um, both physical and mental. Um, and yet uh, the silver lining of this pandemic is like our speakers had said, it has accelerated innovation, has really made us so much more open to new ideas. Uh, now the, the now it remains to be seen, you know, how we can continue this innovation, but at the same time, like Peter had mentioned, making sure that the shiny new thing is actually validated. 
And so uh, my, my message to you all is get vaccinated. Uh, and then if you're sick, stay at home and try to get uh, at home testing if you can. And uh, hopefully we'll see uh, everybody in person soon. Uh, with that, I want to thank Arundhati and Metcity uh, News as well as our wonderful speakers. Uh, it really has been a privilege uh, talking to you all. Thank you everybody and goodbye. Thank you very much for a very engaging discussion, Dr. Radhakrishnan, Dr. Drowin, Peter and Sean. I think many would agree with you that as more and more people go do their routine diagnostic testing that they put on hold during COVID-19 or the crux of COVID-19, since we're not over it yet, um, the lab system might well get um, overwhelmed. And so the option of having some of these tests be available at home is really such a convenience and so important from a healthcare perspective for each individual patient and the system as a whole. So it was a great discussion. Thank you very much.